Hello, sports fans. It's me, Sportsman Z, Bob Zalke. And today I am here with Jason of the Die Hard Yankee Fan 447 channel. And I will link to that channel below. And today we are going to do another in my series of comparison videos where we compare the Chicago White Sox to a team that they will play in 2021. I had planned to do a video like this last year, but before I got to it, it became apparent that the White Sox were not going to play the Yankees in 2020. So uh, hopefully we have a regular 162 game season this year and we play the teams that we are supposed to play. So uh, Jason, welcome to the show. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for having me, Bob. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to having a nice conversation. Yeah, me too. All right. So first I will quickly recap the Yankee or the uh, White Sox, because if you've been watching my channel, you know that I go through the uh, White Sox. So uh, nothing new here. Uh, last year, the White Sox were 35 and 25. We finished tied with the Indians for second in the AL Central. Uh, technically, we were third because we had a worse record against the Indians. Um, and then we went on to the playoffs. We uh, lost to the Oakland A's in the first round. We won the first game of the series, but then lost the second two games. Um, and so let's jump into the lineup for the White Sox. Last year, the White Sox finished second in the American League in batting, 261 batting average, and they were first in home runs with 96. This year, um, th now this lineup I got off Roto Champ. Of course, the lineup is going to be up to Tony La Russa, but uh, we will we'll go with what I saw in Roto Champ. Um, Tim Anderson, the shortstop, he hit 322 last year, which led the team. Adam Eaton and um, slash Adam uh, Engel, it probably depends on who pitches. Engel, I would think, would be the right fielder versus uh, left-handed pitching and Eaton against right Anders, but we'll see if that's how Larusa does it. Um, uh, Nick Madrigal at second, yes, Monty Grandal at catcher, uh, Jose Abreu at first base. He had 19 home runs last year and a 370 on base percentage. Eloy Jimenez in left, Johan Moncada at third, Luis Robert in center. Last year was Robert's rookie year. He hit 251. That's okay, he, had some, he flashed some power, but he was a great defensive center fielder and won the gold glove in the outfield uh, in the AL. And then uh, Lurie Garcia, who might be the DH or utility guy to start the season. So Jason, uh, what are your thoughts on the White Sox lineup? I think it's a pretty solid lineup. I think it's, you know, it offers some good versatility. I'm actually, um, I really liked a couple of the moves they made last year. I liked that they extended Luis, uh, uh, um, Robert early and got him, got him locked up. Um, yeah. You know, I like the versatility. I like the move that they brought uh, bringing in Yasmani Grandal as well. Um, and just the, this, just the combination of you know some good offense, some good runs, you know some good base running, some good um, run manufacturing across the board from the top to the bottom makes for a solid lineup in my opinion. When you combine it with the depth that they have and. Not, not only from the offensive side, but the pitching side, they're well positioned to uh, be a competitive team. And, um, you know, and, and I, to my, in my opinion, they are the clear front runners to win the division in 2021. Um, yes. And they are, they are, in my opinion, the same distance between them and, you know, Cleveland and, and Minnesota as the, the Dodgers and Padres are to the teams below them in the National League West. Right. I think that's how far they've gone. And with the moves that they've already made, um, not only including the offense, but bringing in Lance Lynn and, uh, and you know, and bringing in um, that Liam Hendricks, which was a huge move, in my opinion, um, taking the guy away from the team that beat them in the playoffs last year, um, which I think is going to be a very significant move. But sticking to the offense uh, with Eloy Jimenez and Luis um, and Grandal, um, from top to bottom, to me, they're going to be a really, really hard team to get through. Um, okay. so I see them as the clear front runners in the, in the central. All right. Moving on to the, the, uh, pitching rotation for the, uh, White Sox. We've got Lance Lynn, who we, uh, brought over from Texas in the off season. Uh, uh, Lucas Giolito, who last year had a 104 whip, um, and was excellent. 
second good year in a row for him. So we want to see him continue that. Dallas Keuchel, who we brought in last year in the offseason. Dylan Cease. Michael Kopech, hopefully. We'll see if he um, ends up in the rotation to start the year or if it's later in the year. We'll see because he didn't pitch at all last year. And then I've got Ronaldo Lopez listed as a sixth starter. He'll probably, I mean, invariably every team has injuries and in their pitching staff. And so you're probably going to see Ronaldo Lopez in the rotation at times during the season. Your thoughts? And to, well, and to that point, last night they brought back Carlos Rodon on a one-year deal for $3 million as well, late last night. Oh, all right. Well, well there you go. That's breaking that's nice, right there. Yeah, a nice addition for the White Sox, I think. And he's going to, I think he's going to give Hendricks a break when he needs it, you know, and his ability to get left-handed batters out. See, I, I like the, the pairing of the, the run manufacturing abilities of the lineup and the ability of the pitching rotation starting and bullpen to kind of keep the runs down. So I right. like Julito. I like Keiko. I like the versatility. And I like the Lance Lynn move a lot because I think he gives him that stability, that depth, that workhorse guy um, who I originally thought he was just going to be replacing Rodon. But now you've got both of them. I think Rodon gives these guys some protection, whether it be spot starting or long relief or situational stuff. I think he gives these veterans some more protection. So And the young guys some protection too. So really, really good uh, move. I like Lynn. And if you haven't seen my MLB for Agent Predictions video, I have Trevor Bauer coming to the White Sox. Really? That would be great. He's that my prediction. Um, and I still – I've done I've done my original one and I've done my updated one, and I still have not changed my prediction. I still think the White Sox are going to come in and, and sign him. Um, that would be awesome know. if that happens. It would, I, they would be, in my opinion, if they did that, they'd be the clear favorites to win the World Series, in my opinion. Nice. So. All right. So moving on to the bullpen that we were talking a little bit about, um, you've got Liam Hendricks, who we just brought over, uh, uh, Cody Hewer, uh, Aaron Bummer, Evan Marshall, Matt Foster, um, Jimmy Cordero, Jace Fry, left-hander out there, and Garrett Crotchet, who can throw over 100 miles an hour. So I like that bullpen. Power arms, um, versatility, finesse arms, and the addition of Liam Hendricks really, really puts them, puts them over the top. He's that top, top-to-end elite reliever. And he, to my opinion, he was the best reliever in baseball at least the last two seasons. So yeah. they brought in the guy to kind of close things out at the end of the ball game. So, you know, they, they've made additions to the rotation, to the lineup, to the bullpen. So they've had a very, very well, uh, well-rounded well off season. And I think Hendricks combining with, with, the, with what they have in the bullpen with some of the other power arms really makes them a, a power arm. And if they're in the lead, you know, coming in the sixth or the seventh inning and they turn it over to the bullpen, they're going to be really hard to beat. Right. right. Really hard to beat. And I'm hoping that LaRusa manages the bullpen a little better than uh, Ricky Renneria did. Because he was, he, I think he leaned too heavily on the bullpen. And uh, I want to see a little less of that. Um, I, I agree. I agree. And I just like that he brings championship pedigree. So he's going to have experience and different perspectives to this team. And I think he's going to do a good job at managing players and keeping them you know, healthy and kind of turning things over and moving things around. So he's the, I think he's the right guy for the job. Um, All right. And that leaves us with the bench for the White Sox, which will be Adam Engel when he's not playing, when he's not in the lineup. Uh, Danny Mendick. Um, Zach Collins will be the backup catcher. That's a weak spot for us. That's something I'd like to see them shore up because you got to believe Yasmani Grandal is not going to be able to play 150, 155 games. And Zach Collins isn't really the greatest catcher around. Um, Andrew Vaughn, who may be in the lineup. And if Andrew Vaughn it makes this roster, he may actually switch between DH and first base with Abreu. And then that would free up Garcia to be the super utility man that I think he's better suited for. And then uh, Nicky Delmonico and Micker Adolfo. So that's our bench. I, and, and I think given, a, you know, Abreu a little bit of a break at times or Grandal, I mean, catching 150 games is not an easy feat. So, right. and, you know, that's a lot of wear and tear. And, and I don't know many teams, to be honest with you, that have a backup that's almost as good as a starter. So well, last year we had McCann, but he went to the Mets. So, yeah. And it's usually a precipitous drop off now. So um, I'm hoping that, you know, he can, he can, provide some value when, when, you know, 
uh, Grandal has a break or has a day off or God forbid goes down for some reason, um, you know, that protection on the back end is really, really important. So, and I think the versatility of like a super utility guy who, in my opinion, gives other positional players an opportunity to have a day off, right. play D8, which I think, um, and I've said this before in a, in a lot of my videos, that having a really, really good utility player, one for the outfield and one for the infield, if you can, helps preserve players' health. You know, even if the, if, you, if you, I'd rather have 130 quality games than 150 average ones mm -hmm. for a lot of the starters to keep them healthy. And not a lot of teams do that. So, right. uh, and I think that's where depth really, 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 you know, is, is that, that important. And in this particular off season, there are so many players, whether it be on the bullpen end or kind of super utility end available that I think teams could take advantage of and really bring guys in. So, um, but I think what you have, and you know, you've got good bench depth, but I think it's important to have high end bench depth, no matter what team you are. Yeah. That's so, true. And, you know, and this is where, and when we, when we talk about the Yankees, that's where I think they're deficient. So, but we'll get to that. But, and I think the bench, in my opinion, on the, on the White Sox side is, is stronger than it is with the Yankees, but it's stronger than a lot of the other teams. But the starting lineup is really, really, is healthy and it's strong. And so the balance is good, in my opinion. Um, right. But versatility is very, very important. And if you have one guy or two guys that enable other guys to get some rest days, and I don't know if you know this, but the news broke today in terms of, like you had mentioned, 150 games or 155 games. Right. MLB just proposed 154 game season, but with 162 game pay. So mm -hmm. a little bit of a shorter season um, yeah. with an expanded playoffs um, cool. and starting the season a month later. Now, the union's going to have a meeting today with the player representative to see whether they accept that and, or provide a counteroffer. But that happened today. So, okay. um, and uh, so potentially there could be a little bit of a shorter season, which in turn would, could potentially help players stay a little bit healthier. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was of the opinion that a, a transition season of maybe 140 games or so would have been an ideal situation because right. of pitchers. In my opinion, preserving pitchers, I think it's very difficult to go from 60 innings to 200. And yeah. to me, it's a recipe for injury. So, um, but that remains to be seen what type of season we're going to have. But you, the White Sox lineup, and I think the bench gives them enough depth and protection, whether it's 150 or 162 game season, 120 game season. So right. they're well set up. They're set up nicely. All right. So with that, I will turn it over to you and you can uh, talk about the Yankees, start with the lineup. What's that like? So, thank the heavens that the Yankees re-signed DJ LeMahieu. Right. That's num that was priority number one. Um, we would have been in a lot of trouble had they not done that, particularly since a lot of the players who I thought would have been potentially good fits to kind of fit in and move things around were already off the books or off mm -hmm. the market. So, DJ LeMahieu would be the starter, I mean the leadoff hitter, and then following him would be Aaron Judge, who seems to doesn't look like a prototypical number two, but has been a great number two with the Yankees. You know, getting him as long as he stays healthy, um, the more bats he has, the better. Right. And he's a good guy to bring in. And I think DJ LeMahieu in the leadoff spot again as a 360 hitter, 365 hitter in 2020 and a 3 320 in 2019. That consistency, and he's been one of the few guys that have been consistent, whether the team has been good or bad. And the Yankees, you probably know, are a very streaky team. So they can win 10 in a row and then lose 10 in a row. And it's just kind of, there's a fluctuation. They were 33 and 27 last year, but they started eight and one. Yeah. So, and there was a bit of a tailspin. Um, and, um, and it just, it is, you know, it is what it is. But so judge, I would have it second, um, batting second, followed by Aaron Hicks at the three spot. Who's one of our switch hitters mm -hmm. followed by Giancarlo Stanton at the cleanup spot. And then uh, being DH, Aaron Hicks would be the center fielder and Judge would be the right fielder and DJ second base. Uh, then Luke Voigt at the five spot, who's going to be our first baseman. Mm -hmm. Labor Torres, our shortstop. And then Clint Frazier, in my opinion. Last year he batted ninth, but I think he's earned himself to move a couple of, uh, move up a couple of spots. Right. He's shown the offensive potential, and I would much rather him batting at the seventh spot with the ability to drive in multiple guys mm -hmm. because he has one of the things that Miguel Andujar has. They're kind of doubles hitting machines. Mm -hmm. and just, they can drive in a lot of runs if they're given opportunities. And he's shown the ability to do that. So I would move him to the seventh spot as our left fielder, mm -hmm. um, followed by Gio Urshela at the eighth spot playing third base. And then Gary Sanchez at the ninth spot uh, with catcher 
with right. Kyle Hitashioka would be his backup. But um, he he was, as you know, he's one of the people that are most indicative of that streaky team of the Yankees. He can mm-hmm. have a, 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 a Thurman Munson type here, and then he can yeah. have the year that he had last year. And it's unfortunate, but he's wildly inconsistent. Right. And he can hit 40 home runs, but then bat 175 the following year. So there are some inconsistencies there. Now, in his defense, too, he the last couple of years, he's had to change stances every single year with a new catching you know, development uh, staff. So he's made a lot of adjustments, but that doesn't necessarily indicate you know, or affect his bat as much as it does his defense. He's always had issues with defense, mm-hmm. um, but his bat is kind of his moneymaker. Yeah. And I was actually surprised personally that they, they brought him back. I thought they were going to either go for somebody like a James McCann or maybe trade for somebody like um, uh, Wilson Contreras from the Chicago Cubs. Mm-hmm. who is a little bit more – he has a better grasp of managing an entire pitching staff than Sanchez yeah. does. So – and that's the other component that's important. But as of now, I've got him batting night. But if he shows, you know, to be healthy and consistent, he, he'll probably move up. Um, right. But this seems to be a really well, well-stacked well lineup right now. But their ability to stay healthy is, is the chief concern. Right. So. That's, and it, when I actually, you, um, it'd be interesting to note that all of the players that you mentioned were in the lineup listed on Roto Champ when I checked it before the meeting. So, yeah, and they did have Sanchez batting ninth on that, too. But uh, yeah. it, it is, it's a formidable lineup, though, that's for sure. Yeah, provided they stay healthy. I mean, yes. the key. every year with the Yankees, they, they have a number of guys go down. And the problem, like I mentioned before, has been the depth to come in behind them. Um, mm-hmm. And they haven't, you know, they've been notoriously streaky as well. And there's some guys that I like, but, you know, I, I was a real um, a fan of bringing in somebody like Tommy Lestella this year because he has the ability to play multiple positions. Yeah. He would have been a clear upgrade over what we had. Um, but mm-hmm. unfortunately, he moved to, the, you know, he went to the San Francisco Giants right. or somebody yeah. like a Jerickson Profar who can play the infield and the outfield he went back to the Padres mm-hmm. um, and Cesar Hernandez went to the Indians so um, I do st- I still think there's a couple of moves that are going to be made particularly since they're still over the 40-man threshold right now mm-hmm. um, by one with the Darren O'Day move so they have to make a move mm-hmm. anyway so I-, I can't see them clearing from some of the superfluous kind of depth that they have on the 40-man um, and bringing in an O'Day but I still see them bringing in a le- potentially a lefty bat who can play multiple positions. Now, okay. it could be Brett Gardner. I didn't mention him in the starting lineup because I don't think he should be the starter anyway. Yeah. But I think Clint Frazier's earned that right. But I would not be surprised if they brought him back as the fourth outfielder or the fifth outfielder with because they've also traded for a guy named Greg Allen. Um, right, right. And, uh, he plays. He's a light hitter, but he plays multiple outfield positions. Right. He's eight, years, eight years younger than Gardner. He's got four years of team control. And team control now with these huge contracts – on the other hand, are really yeah. important. And he came over from the Indians, correct? He did. Yeah, he did. And uh, I think he'll be a solid guy. I mean, you know, I he'll be a solid a solid addition. And somebody who can play multiple positions, we have not had that in a while. Yeah. So um, I think he'll be a good backup. For a All right. Time. So uh, let's move on to the uh, Yankees rotation, uh, which, of course, is headed by Garrett Cole. But after that... We have some question marks. <laughs> we do. We do. And, and Garrett Cole is obviously the clear number one. I mean, it's, it's – and the Yankees have had – they've had a problem a bunch of years. They've either had a clear-cut starter and then nothing but threes and fours after that. Mm-hmm. Or the other way around, they've never had a three uh, a clear-cut starter. And they just – they've kind of been all over the place. So it's been a while since they've had the kind of front-headed rotation like a Giolito and a Lin and a Keiko, like a three-headed monster. Right. Um, been a while since they've had that i'm talking back you know to the aj burnett and cc sabathia 2009 that was a solid one with pettit there too that wasn't that was the last time in my opinion they had a a three-headed monster but behind cole i've got Corey kluber coming in at the number two Mm -hmm. um you know he's shown to be healthy and hopefully he does stay healthy um and then i have jordan montgomery actually being Mm -hmm. the number three um and he's earned the right he's three years out of tommy john surgery shown to be healthy and i think we need a lefty in that rotation, which is one reason I was pushing for Carlos Rodon, because aside from Montgomery, the Yankees have no lefties. Oh, really? Yeah. Only one. So um, so he'd be the number three. And then at the number four spot, I'd have Jamison Tyon, recently acquired from the Pirates. Yeah. And um, 
and then a combination of guys at the number five spot. Now, Luis Severino is not going to be back until the summertime. So I don't even have him in the, in, in the, uh, in, in the scenario here. Mm-hmm. Personally, I don't think he'll be at full strength until 2022. Um, but that's, I would ease guys back from Tommy John. So at the number five, I would be splitting between Davey Garcia and Clark Schmidt. Um, and I will say this about Clark Schmidt and Jamison Ty on this off season, they've changed some of their mechanics to make them less kind of stressful on the arm. And they're both recovering from Tommy John surgery. Right. So a little bit more mechanically efficient. So I'm hoping that's going to help them. But, and then, you know, in the third spot for number five, Domingo Herman coming back. Now, He's not coming back from injury. He's coming back from suspension, but missing a season right. is missing a season. Yes, yes, so, just like Kopech. So, yeah. yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of these guys who have opted out for, you know, pandemic reasons, and I get that, mm-hmm. um, but missing a season, it is what it is. So uh, he would, in my opinion, would be a good guy to bring in long relief because the Yankees are down Tommy Conley now. He had Tommy John and he signed with the Dodgers. So, mm-hmm. and, you know, they moved out of Eno. So they, they need some pieces but right. he would be a good guy to spot starter come in along the lead to kind of ease him back into um you know kind of full-time pitching again I, I wouldn't throw him to the wolves just yet and expect him to be the number two and even though he was 18 and four two years ago if you dive into his stats you know at, after the fifth inning he would fall off dramatically and that's yeah. where that elite bullpen would come in but when you do that and we don't have guys that can go beyond five it really stresses the bullpen so right. I think the depth here, you know, bringing in some of these guys who are definitely health questions and question marks, but having a little bit more depth now would get, at the very least give some uh, guys who, who might have a really bad game to bring in some of these potential starters to throw long relief or four innings or five innings. So they have more depth than they did before. Mm-hmm. I still think I'm of the opinion that bringing in another, a clear number two would be a really good idea for the Yankees. Yeah, um, definitely. And that's my that's my view on it. The notes that I had basically are that um, that Tyon Kluber and Montgomery are injury concerns, but other than that, yes, if they can stay healthy and they can pitch like they have and like they're capable of, then yeah, it's a it's a good rotation. And 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 on, to that point too, that's one reason I was uh, 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 I w- I've been suggesting in some of my other videos that the Yankees potentially do a six man rotation this year. Because mm-hmm. of these question marks. Yeah. So if you can get them to the point where they can stay healthy and throw 110 to 120 innings, I would take that right. with, a six, with a sixth guy in there, which would stretch some of these guys out and keep them healthy because they're such injury concerns. And we've got three rotation guys coming back from Tommy John. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Yeah, so that is. The more depth that we have, the better. The more you know, we have guys' that ability to throw multiple innings, the better. So, right. And that's just the way, that's the way I look at it. But we'll, it remains to be seen. We'll see what they do. Okay. So let's move on to the uh, Yankees bullpen. So the bullpen, um, we've got a bunch of guys. And, you know, some young guys, you know, they were minus two already with Adovino and Conley moving out. But so we've got Nick Nelson, one of the young players, one of their prospects who, who, who came up in 2020, had a solid year I mean, when he had opportunities. Um, and then you get Chad Green, who's been a real good stabilizer for the Yankees. He's one of the guys that shows the ability to throw three innings if they need it. Mm-hmm. And he's one of the harder throwers on the team, too. Right. Um, and the Yankees have always kind of built themselves on power arms. But um, he's one of the clear power arms. Um, then we've got Zach Britton, who's uh, been actually fantastic for the Yankees on the left-hand side. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm really glad that, you know, he's back with us. And he's been another stabilizer. He also shows the ability to throw two innings which I think the Yankees need with this particular rotation. So, um, and then Luis Sessa, um, he's had opportunities, also been a spot starter uh, on multiple innings as well, two, three innings, sometimes four. Um, So I like these kind of volume guys in the bullpen where they can throw two, three innings because the Yankees often need that. Mm -hmm. Um, Then you got Ben Heller, who's another one of these young prospects who's come up. He's had a good opportunity. He's been up and down but he's shown to be a a pretty valuable arm for the Yankees. Um, And then their newest acquisition, Darren O'Day, who they just brought in this, this past week. And to me, he's, he's a key spot because replacing Adam Adovino, who was death on right-handed hitters. Yeah. Darren O'Day is also death on right-handed hitters and the Yankees need Mm -hmm. that. Um, And, but they got him in at a fraction of the price, which allows them 
some payroll flexibility to bring in maybe somebody who's death on left-handed hitters. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what they do there, but he's, I'm really happy with this signing. Um, and then you've got the closer of Roldis Chapman. Um, you know, he's been dominant throughout the season, but he's made some of the worst pitches at the worst times during the postseason. Yeah. Last couple seasons, unfortunately. So, mm -hmm. but during the regular season, his stats are kind of Josh Hader like. He's very dominant. So yeah. we could just put it together and maybe and this is why I like O'Day and you know the ability to bring in another power arm to maybe take some of the pressure off of Chapman. Um, to give mm -hmm. him an opportunity to either have a break or set somebody up from time to time. And I like to be closer, but um, somebody who can fill that role on occasion too would be a good idea, um, which is why I, I was actually a fan. I, I was hoping they would bring in Liam Hendricks. So you guys did a really good job of taking yeah. Hendricks. <laughs> and, uh, um, so, but back to the bullpen, Brooks Kriske is one of their younger pitchers and he's he kind of shown to be a, a strong arm as well. I think this year he's probably going to be the 2021 version of Chad Green. Another one of these guys that steps up, can throw multiple innings and get guys out in key spots. Um, it's a young pitcher. And the Yankees do a better job at developing relievers than they do starters. That's one of the observations I made over the last two decades. And aside from Andy Pettit and some of these other guys, they're just much stronger in the relief development. And guys like this are kind of clear examples of it. Right. Um, and last but not least, Johnny Lasagna or Jonathan Lo Loizaga. Mm -hmm. um, he also has the ability to come in and throw a solid inning or multiple innings as well. So the Yankees seem to have more of the versatile arms this year than they do the power arms. Mm -hmm. So, which to me is fine because I think with that rotation, they kind of need that. Um, would I like for them to bring in one more guy in the bullpen and another starter? Yes, but we'll see what happens. I think they have, you know, they're in a better spot than they were last year. I can say that, but I still think there's a move or two to be made. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that relates to the bench as well. So, okay. And speaking of which, why don't you talk about the uh, Yankees bench? So we currently have Greg Allen in the outfield. Let's go with the outfield first. Greg Allen, newly acquired outfielder and Estevan Florio, one of their younger top prospects. Now he had a little bit of a cup of coffee in the majors. So we'll see what type of opportunities. And that's one reason I would not be upset as much as I love Brett Gardner. I think giving their younger guys opportunities is a good idea. So I think Greg Allen could hold down the fourth, the fourth outfield spot and keeping somebody like, um, you know, Floreal gives him a young player an opportunity to see what he can do in the outfield. Yeah. Um, now, when you transition over to the infield, we've got Tyler Wade and Thiago Estrada. And we also have Mike Talkman, excuse me, for the outfield too. Right. Um, and he's shown the ability to hit at the major league level, but, and I hate using 2020 as because it was such an anomaly for so many players. Yeah, you know, it was. Some of our bench players like Mike Ford and Topman had really good 2019 seasons and they fell off tremendously in 2020. But again, I kind of consider it an anomaly of a season for so many. So I'm hoping that they have a rebound in 2021 because they have shown the ability to hit timely hitting as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Topman then transitioning to the infield, Tyler Wade, Tiara Estrada and Mike Ford are the other other three infield uh, spots. Now, I had said I wanted to bring in Tommy LaStella because he represents a, a clear upgrade over those guys. But I wouldn't, you know, I would be fine with those three guys. Um, yeah. I would also be fine if they brought in somebody like Colton Wong, who can play multiple infield positions right. and get a lefty bat. So, um, but I like Mike Ford. I like Talkman and I like Tyler Wade. They have the ability to kind of play – you know, multiple positions. My concern is having somebody who can, who can play, you know, once a week and still perform, you know, because a lot of these guys, unfortunately for the Yankees, you know, they just sit for 10 days and they come and then they're hit, their timing's not there. And when you're going up against somebody like, you know, Giolito or uh, Justin Verland or Jacob deGrom, it's really hard to catch up to these guys yeah. when the timing isn't there. And some of these just nasty relievers like Josh Hader and like Devin Williams, right, right. it's really hard. So that's where I emphasize an upgrade in bench depth where I think it's so important. So people that have the ability to kind of not play on a regular basis, but still perform. So I'm hoping that the Yankees, the guys that we have can you know, show the ability to do that in 2021. I still right. think Brett Gardner's good. I mean, not Brett Gardner, uh, John Brian Cashman is going to make a move to some capacity to bring in a versatile player. Yeah. Um, but I just don't know who it's going to be. Um, but, and last but not least, Kyle Higashioka, who's the backup catcher. Right. We have, he's another catcher on the 40 man roster as we speak. So behind Garrett, and he's actually been 
become Garrett Cole's personal catcher. So mm-hmm. he's important. Yes, yes. Um, and he's important. So, um, and he's shown the ability to hit. So I, I can't take that away from him too. And it's, he's had, when once he's had the opportunities last year, because Gary Sanchez was so inconsistent, was benched for so many games, mm-hmm. he actually showed the, you know, he had, there was his first opportunity to get regular playing time and he showed to be pretty good. So um, I would keep him around, you know, and he, yeah. he's a valuable, in my opinion, a valuable bench piece. So those are generally my, my bench players for the Yankees. All right. So I will say that I agree with you on the fact that the um, I think the White Sox will should definitely be the favorite to win the AL Central Division. Um, what do you see for the Yankees in 2021? Well, I see the team that was ahead of them, the Tampa Bay uh, Rays, regress a little bit, having lost yeah. Blake Snell and Charlie. Yeah. So I think it's an opportunity for the Yankees who didn't make sexy moves. I think. Um, in my opinion, with the depth moves that they've made within the budget parameters that they had, I think were efficient moves. Um, I think they're probably going to be the favorites to win the American League East, but I don't think it's it's going to be very – I think it's going to be close between them and Toronto. Yeah, Toronto, who just brought in Springer. so And, and Marcus Simeon. Right, right. So yeah. – and they loaded up on the bullpen. And I would not be surprised if they brought in, you know, traded for a Kyle Hendricks or signed Trevor Bauer out of nowhere. I still think there's – they know that they need a pitcher. And mm-hmm. I think they're going to bring in somebody. So right. they did just trade for Steven Matz from the Mets as a depth starter. So they have another pitcher. But I think it's going to be very close. And I think it's going to be close between the Yankees, Toronto with Tampa Bay probably in third. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised because they do a very good job. They're kind of, they remind me of the Oakland A's. They do a lot with a little. Yeah. With a little budget and just the players that they have, not flashy moves, but do a really good job of developing players. And people just get better when they go to Tampa Bay. Right. So it's poking yeah, and it's developing. So I won't sleep on the Tampa Bay Rays at all. Would I be no. surprised if they won the division? Nope. So um, I think the Toronto Blue Jays are – probably a year away or a piece or two away from being favorites for the mm-hmm. division, but it's still, there's still a lot of guys out there to be had. So okay. that's where I think they stand right now. I think the Yankees are slim favorites to win the division. I think the White Sox are wide favorites to win the division. Yeah. Yeah. I would tend to agree with you. So, yeah. So nice discussion there, Jason. Um, I'm, I'm glad you were able to join me and talk about the Yankees. It's always nice to get the other team, you know, a fan of the other team's perspective instead of me just doing both teams. But uh, yeah. So um, I, I, it was a, it was a pleasure having you and uh, I appreciate it. And, and again, uh, Jason's channel is um, Die Hard Yankee Fan 447. Check it out. Um, he talks about the Yankees. He talks about baseball, deals that are going down. Uh, a very interesting channel. So um, with that, I think we are just going to say goodbye. And uh, it was nice having you. Thank you. Have a great season. Go White Sox. And uh, thanks for having me today, Bob. All right. Yeah, you too. Bye. Take care. Talk to you now.